In the latest developments surrounding Shane Bieber, the Guardians have informed teams they intend to trade him to whichever club used the fewest Justin Bieber puns early in Shane's career. Yeah, should have thought about that, huh? Okay, I may have led with Shane Bieber, but I don't mean to bury the true lead here. Remember back in the day, you'd be in the backseat. I want to stop for McDonald's. What was the retort? It was always, we've got McDonald's at home. Well, for like the last week, I've been hearing, we really want Eniel De Los Santos back. The Guardian said, we got Eniel De Los Santos at home. And it's Jaime Barria. And we're here for an emergency podcast with Zach and TJ to react to the latest big news of the Cleveland Guardians. Not a Shane Bieber trade. We already talked about Cal Quantrill and... No. Jaime Barria. Your initial thoughts. I need initial reaction. Lay it all out for me. His metrics are not pretty. I don't really see anything statistically or with his pitch mix that jumps off the page. But I can tell you if there's a pitcher that the Angels let go who is going to the Guardians, that's like going from Burger King to Red Steakhouse. (laughs) And where have we seen this before? It always works out perfectly when the guy goes from the Angels to the Guardians. Always. I can't recall the last picture that that would have happened and it didn't go well. I mean, anyone come to your mind? Completely drawing a blank here. For every Lucas Giolito, there's a Mike Clevenger and a reverse Vinny Pistano. (laughs) Okay. Fair enough. Well, I think people are here to to hear our, our reactions to the news, news, the rumor, whatever you want to phrase it. Shane Bieber could be on the move at the winter meeting. Certainly the Guardians what? are going to listen if anybody were to come calling. And according to reports from our pal John Morosi, who is linking teams to Bieber, Cubs, Reds. We had spent our, our Patreon show. I can't remember what day of the week it is. We had spent our Patreon show talking about the thin rotation and whether or not a Bieber trade would make sense. Has anything changed in the last 48 hours? Is that depth somehow better? Are you more in favor of a Bieber trade now? Knowing that it could be the Reds, it could be the Cubs, it could be anybody. Anything changed for you? No. <laughs> no. And I'm- All right, well, that's it for another week. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Go get your mug over at Patreon. Go do Look, that. I, I want <laughs> baseball to be worth talking about as many of the 365 days as possible. 366 next year. Don't forget. Leap year. My favorite. Uh, but I like we how many times do we have to play this game? Right? Like it's we did this with Kluber. We did this with Bauer. We did this with Lindor. It's we can we can link every single team we want. I mean, this is what GMs do. They all talk. Guess what? They're all going to be in the same building next week. They're all going to talk. So I, I'm of the opinion that if the market for Bieber is what I think it will be. I, like if if I were Chris Antonetti, I probably wouldn't trade him. But I certainly think they could. Like none of that has changed. Um, I think, regardless of what they do, I think they need to address their starting pitching depth. I think they need more of it. There's just too much risk involved, and I don't want to rehash conversations we've had on various shows over the last six weeks since the season ended. But, you know, I I think the reason I have a lot of hesitancy in a Bieber trade is because I I, I think the Guardians want to be good in 2024. And I don't know that a Bieber trade can make them better. If you do some sort of Bieber for Anthony Santander type trade, maybe, but that's like the only scenario where it makes sense to me. If you're dealing him for prospects, number one, you're dealing him when his trade value is low. He's got one year of team control left and he's not 2020 Shane Bieber. And teams are going to be a little scared by 
the injury risk. He's been he's missed significant time to the last three years, and it has taken a toll on his stuff. So it, it's we like this isn't the other scenarios where they trade Clevenger, you know, when he had two and a half years left, and they traded Bauer knowing they weren't going to re-sign him, and he still had two playoff runs in him. Uh, Kluber's a little bit like this, and they were able to get Emmanuel Classe. I mean, I you know, if you can pull something like that off, fine. But I just, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me given where they're at in their timeline to trade him for prospects. Because if you were going to trade him for prospects, trade him a year ago, trade him a year and a half ago. Um, so I, I just, I don't, and plus you get a comp pick. If you keep him all year, like is what you're going to get for, in terms of prospects now, going to be that much better than what you get with the draft pick you get when he walks like I, it's weird to me I, I right just, if we're I, talking prospects yes and absolutely i understand their the way they operate i don't always agree with it but i get it and i understand in a vacuum that this is a this is what they do in this situation. I understand why every national writer just assumes Bieber's gone and like this is what the Guardians do. They don't play their blah, blah, blah. I get it. But it's hard for me to envision a scenario where they trade him and like unless it's just, hey, we gotta get off this twelve million dollars. Well then why did you go trade for a seven million dollar setup? Then? So it's it's <laughs> right. very strange. I, I just don't see a More scenario than that, where it's like why did you try why did you trade me? For a reliever that you would only control for one year, what's the benefit of that at the same time? Right. If you're, unless you are trading Bieber for somebody that helps you offensively, the trade that we've talked about for a couple of months now, if there's some scenario like you just mentioned with Baltimore where you flip the, the pitcher for the offensive player that you greatly covet, okay. But still, even if you do that, as we've talked about for the last couple of weeks, that's adding another item to the list. Now you need to fortify this rotation you need to add somebody now it's it's not going to be another Bieber well you're not adding that ceiling but you certainly need to protect yourself at the back end and at that point are we just into we're, we're going in a giant circle here because you just had that guy and you traded him to the Rockies now I know all of this doesn't happen all at once so this unfolds and you got to make it a, a choice on quant or uh, yeah on Quantrill now so you trade him and Maybe you don't initially know right now what that's going to mean for Shane Bieber, but you got to have a little bit of foresight, and I think that they do. I know this front office is smart, so I don't think they're getting caught here with the proverbial pants down. I, I think they've got this mapped out to a degree, at least I hope so, and I just don't see a scenario where it makes a lot of sense to trade Bieber for that prospect because it's not going to be the prospect hole that you would have thought of three years ago if— if you're talking about that, then sure, maybe you can make a case that it can, it can work. But if it's going to be somebody's sea level prospect here, just so you get something, to, I will take the the bet that he's going to come back and at least be a good two this year. And if you're trying to compete, uh, guess what? That makes you better to have a Shane Bieber part of this rotation than not having him. The only scenario that works here is if <laughs> we can get into this. There's some three-team deal, which I've seen so many of, and I pulled up baseball trade values. I've got so many trades to ask you about. But the three-team deals that involve the Reds and, oh, I don't know, the Tampa Bay Rays, and maybe it it ends with, down this rainbow road, it leads you to Randy Arozarena in your corner outfield. Is there some scenario where that makes sense? I'm pretty firmly in the, the if there if you got to join a side here, I'm on the side of Keep Bieber at this point. Unless somebody completely knocks my socks off with something I'm not expecting. Sorry, I'm holding on to Bieber because I think that's just, it's the smartest thing to do where this organization is at and given what his value is, at least what my expectation is of his value. Yeah, I'm with you. And I, and I think, I mean, do you know why they traded Aaron Savali four months ago? Because his value is at its peak. It'll never be higher the rest of his life. So they capitalized on that. And when they did that, they acquired a hitter who's probably going to hit in the middle of their lineup for the next X number of years. I don't think you can do that here. Maybe with the trade that you've been talking about for months, where you're flipping him for a hitter with similar team control. But that's it. If you can do that, great. Like, that makes sense. You still, you need pitching depth regardless. Um, and they're going to have to address that. And I don't think it can just be 
you know, patch this together with some non-roster guys. I think like you're going to have to spend a little bit of money if you want to actually do something. And so it's just how desperate are you going to be for this? This team's never in this position. Um, and, I, and I do wonder too, like if Daniel Espino didn't have two lost years, how different this looks, right? Like maybe they trade Bieber a year ago and they get something really good for him. And you're looking at Espino, Williams, Bybee, McKenzie, and Allen. And you're like, remember Bieber? They didn't need him. Look how good this rotation is. And it's young and it's cheap and you can build around it. Obviously, guys get hurt. That's part of this. But that's why you need depth. So I, I, I'm with you. I'm probably in the camp of keep Bieber because it's hard for me to envision that scenario where you're not trading him just to trade him. I think that'd be a mistake. You're because you're you're right. It's like you were describing. It's like you're playing whack a mole. Hey, I hit this mole in the top left corner, but when I did that, one in the bottom right corner sprang up, and I missed him. And I'm just this game never ends. Just constantly whacking moles. And you already ripped one of the moles out and threw him to the Rockies. <laughs> so it's okay. Based on the the activity that they've done so far in trading Quantrill, so cuts into your depth there, and then trading for Barlow, who's a one-year fix in your bullpen, those two things in tandem tell me the the most likely outcome here is you keep Shane Bieber. I think if they're drawing it up today, like if they're putting odds on it in the front office and they're thinking, what is the most likely outcome we sit here, push past the winter meetings, we're, we're far past January, we're heading to February, is Shane Bieber still here? I think they have set it up on their, their chessboard so far that yes, he is. I understand shopping. We don't got to go down this road again. We, we've covered this. Everybody covers it. There's benefit for, for talking. You're, you're going to go to the winter meetings. What the hell else are you going to do? Have the conversations. There's nothing that is going to hurt you in knowing more information about how a team values your players. Nothing. And it also, as we've talked about many times before, could set you up for if, if this season goes off the rails, you've already had established conversations. You are familiar with what teams are willing to give up. And so you've already done some of the homework now that can maybe help better the, the trade down the line. You don't want to be in that situation, but you got to plan for all these different scenarios. At the end of the day, I still think the Guardians believe Bieber will be here based on what they've done so far. Unless the only scenario where I'm off base here, when has that ever happened? Is if I just don't see the full... I don't see the full whiteboard here with every move mapped out. Because if you trade a Shane Bieber and you're clearing that $12 million, if you don't take that $12 million and take whatever assets, assets that's helped you create, if you don't turn that into something meaningful, what the hell are we doing here? Why are we doing this show? <laughs> like, what's the point of all of this? Bring on the asteroid now. Do you trust the front office? As much as you did maybe a year ago, year and a half ago? But yeah. Do you have blind faith in them? Blind faith? No. I don't, should you have blind? I don't have blind faith in anybody, including myself. Mm. <laughs> don't trust you. Don't trust me. No, I, I would say that it's taken a little bit of a hit over the last year or so. Yeah, I'm, I I'm interested. I still I, you think know, they're I wonder smart, if people though. agree with you. Because I think there used to be a, a matter of, like, remember the, what's the old bit? Like, Tampa makes a trade, and there's a tweet that's like, wow, great trade for the Rays. Who'd they give up? And who did they get? <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. You just assume they're going to win it. And I think for a while, Cleveland fell into that. I, and I wonder if now people are like, well, are we sure? Are we sure they have a good handle on this? Do you, do you trust them implicitly? Sure about that? Yeah. And I, I don't know how I feel. I, I, I think... I don't know. I, I can answer my own question better maybe in a week after I've spent time at the winter meetings and talked to a lot of people. And <laughs> Oh, sure. Once it's actually happened, yeah, then, then you'll have much more. 
information to go on. <laughs> Once no, I know who I... wins the World Series, I'll have a better idea of who I think will actually win the World Series. <laughs> no, I just think you get a better handle on. I know. Like last last year, what were the conversations like that we were having this time of year? And then at the winter meetings, they signed Josh Bell. And it's like, okay, there's clarity. And then we were talking about, you know, I had heard that if Sean Murphy didn't work out, Mike Zanino was a guy to watch. And they signed Mike Zanino. And I think we were both like, hey, this makes sense. Like, they had two glaring holes. They filled them. And we'll see what happens. Well, we saw what happens. But this offseason, I'm like, I mean, there are glaring holes. And there are also some other maybe roster issues that they need to address that are lower on the priority list, but still kind of important. There's a lot of clutter and a lot of unknown commodities. And I'm not, I don't see the forest through the trees. I I guess I just don't know exactly where this is headed, how they get resolution to all the questions I have. And given that I, we, we, we really both think that they're not that far off. Why are you complicating matters by adding 16 new things to the list when, when the list isn't really that long? What what plagues you? I mean, it's not not like it's easy to go get, hey, go get a quarter outfielder that can hit in the middle of your lineup. Uh, every team that's that has even a small hope of contending is trying to do the same thing. Once those players. I'm not saying it's easy to acquire them, but I'd much rather be in the position of the Guardians where it's like, damn, you add even what Forget the fact that they could use a couple of, of bats. You add one, and then I've got all of the minor league depth that I think is going to be arriving in the next year. Then I, I'm like, okay, I, I'm excited. Because I think you've got DH first base figured out in Manzardo. And maybe we see Chase the Lauder this year. And then George, you know, only one of those guys really needs to show up. By adding one bat. That's with as much as this offense is has struggled and pissed us off, and was tough to watch, and had no power last year, I feel like, given what they already have in young players that like Manzardo that is ready to make that jump, adding one bat, and then those younger players, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like the horizon is super far off. So, I mentioned this last week, and this is going to be my refrain, until I have an answer. But I, I, what is this team's timeline to win? What do they think it is? And is that accurate? Because they've, you know, we're talking about trust and blind faith and everything. They, they've they been wrong about this. I mean, they didn't, in 2022, they didn't go into that season, first of all, thinking they were going to sign Jose Ramirez to an extension or think that they were going to win 92 games and almost make the ALCS. So they, they arrived early, earlier than their internal expectations. And then last season, they fell flat. So... What do they think? If you gave them truth serum, what would they say about 2024? And, you know, what what is the timeline here? I just, I, I there's some things that don't quite jibe, right? Like, the Barlow thing is weird, and I, I said this the other day, I don't want to make a big deal about a 7th, 8th inning guy. But I kind of have to when, as of this moment, he's projected to make, like, 10, 8 to 10 percent of their payroll. Like, that's bizarre, right? So, I, I, and he's only here for one year. And I'm not saying that that means they're going all in, but it means that they value 2024. So, how much? Because you're right. I think for the, you know, the pitching side, like, they're here. Like, 20, is 2024 going to be their best rotation that they have in the next decade? If they keep Bieber, maybe. If McKenzie's healthy, maybe. Or is it down the line? Is it Espino comes back from this shoulder thing and, you know, in two years, like he's a legit dude too. And Bybee by then is a Cy Young candidate. Williams is an ace and like everything's looking great. And then the position player side, it's weird because like Jose Ramirez's best days are probably not ahead of him. Josh Naylor only has two years of team control. But do you need to wait for DeLauder? And Brito and Manzardo to blossom in the majors. Like, that's not going to happen in 2024. You got to let those guys develop some. So maybe they get their feet wet this year. But when is your best position player group? Is it in 2026? And how old is Jose Ramirez then? 33, 34? And like, what does he look like at that point? Like, I, it's weird. I, I don't know the answer to that. 
I think they have enough talent if they just fill their glaring holes to win the division. And then, I don't know, maybe they're built for the playoffs because they have a couple horses, studs in the rotation, and they'll have a better bullpen, and maybe they find some guys who hit for That's a lot to ask for. But I, I guess I just, like, how much emphasis are you placing? How much urgency are you placing on 2024 if you're the front office versus two years from now? Because that that fuels a lot of your decision making. And I don't know the answer to that. You also have a very young coaching staff. Um, so does that play into it too? You know, do you are you just gonna try to say, hey, we think we have a playoff team. Go meet our expectations, or is it gonna be like, let's everybody's new and this is different and the roster, we're not quite sure. We need bounce backs. Like, like I which is it? Like that that's I think going into the winter meetings, that's my biggest the thing I want answers to. Um because I, I don't know the answer, and they've also not, they've been wrong about this. So, what have they learned from the last two years? I think part of what frustrates me at times is I actually do have a lot of faith in the front office, and I think they're smart for the most part. I think they get way more right than they get wrong for as much as they did get wrong over the, over the last year or so. <laughs> I find it easier when a front office just, is just stupid because they like, <laughs> you're dumb. You make unwise decisions because you are unwise. But it's kind of like when you're when your kid just makes a mistake but you know they're a good kid and you get frustrated because you're like you're better than this, right? You you know better. We taught you better. And it's like this front office when they when they do things when they do certain things and this is this is the characteristics of a stupid front office. This is not you. You are better than this. You are smarter than this. We have a track record that demonstrates all of this, all of the things you get right. So when they, they have a one trip up and they they trade a guy that somewhere and he has a great year. Okay, when it happens a couple of times. Oh, okay, when it happens over and over again in a small window, of course I'm going to be frustrated about it. And the same thing. I want to give them the the benefit of an offseason being that chance, as we talked about, to craft it over a long period of time. And you don't see the entire puzzle. I'm not saying I have to see it right now. As we saw, the, the Quantrill thing was just the beginning, and then that led to another thing. They were linked together, but you didn't know that when they DFA'd Cal Quantrill, whether or not you agree with the move. And it's going to be a similar thing with Bieber, I think. If they do decide to trade Bieber... We're going to get come on here. We're going to start reacting to it immediately. But as I said, it needs to be the first, well, maybe not the first, but one of a series of moves. Otherwise, then it really doesn't make sense. And I'm right back in that frustration of, you guys are smart. What the hell are you doing? I think that the big thing to me is, <laughs> no matter what they do, I understand sometimes a lineup's not good one year. But you expect some internal development and regression going into the next. And, and so you you can live with it. And I don't want to say live, live with like stagnancy, but you understand that, you know, this stuff's not linear and, and guys have peaks and valleys. It's a little different when you look at the outfield and it was like historically inept, right? I mean, it was, I th they had like a third of the home runs of the second worst outfield. <laughs> okay. So you are so far behind the pack that I don't think adding Jonathan Rodriguez to the 40 man and like, I, that's it. I mean, I like, are you going to trot out an opening day outfield of Quan straw and Brennan? Like Loriano, he's not, that's not the solution. So I, it, it's hard for me to envision any front office, let alone what I think is a pretty smart front office, just being like, yeah, like, can't possibly be that bad again. I, I guess not, maybe, but you're not trying to be better than that outfield. You're trying to be, like, league average, and there's a long way to go yeah. to get back to league average. I, I mean, if you want to bake some of that thought into your evaluation, I get it. You, you think there is some regression, positive regression coming? You, you want to bake that into what you think could be 
part of a turnaround here, why you go are going to be better, fine. But you better mitigate some of that risk by bringing in other options, more proven options. And if you're going to trade your guy that's been your ace, you got to get back something that's helping you equally somewhere else. Otherwise, just keep him. Because it, this is not the case of Ahmed Rosario here. You already said at the end of this, if nothing else, you throw the qualifying offer on him. He most likely dec declines that. And then you're going to get something for him. It's not like he's walking away and you get nothing. And then you're trusting your draft evaluation. And then you don't have to do like the, uh, we're going to make this trade three years after this draft and we really had our eye on this one guy, so we're going to take this long shot. And You could just draft him now. <laughs> you could just take that draft capital and use it positively. So, I, and, and on top of that, you get the benefit of having Shane Bieber for the entire season. I, I guess the only anxiety you would feel about it is if he gets hurt again, you can't trade him, like in July rolls around, you can't trade him, and then he's hurt, so you can't offer him the qualifying offer. But still, like then wouldn't you, wouldn't you still be able to work out some sort of deal to keep him around? And <laughs> there's, it takes some risk to win. But not even taking the risk and not trying to win is a waste of everyone's time. Like, I don't know. We said this recently, but you have to be good at something. And if that thing is going to be starting pitching, then let it be starting pitching. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't think you're going to transform your offense into some murderer's row so you better be strong on the pitching side and as it stands right now i think they could have a really good rotation but you know trading bieber for two kids at high a who aren't nearly as good as the prospects you would have gotten for him if he was healthy six months ago doing that and signing like i don't uh, carlos carrasco to a one year incentive laden deal. I don't think that's going to help your chances in 2024. And it might not no, help your you... chances when those prospects like at this, like you're not getting your a top 50 guy for him. Are you? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. I mean, you could get creative. You can think of ways you take back a contract that maybe gets you a better player, but that, that, that goes against what this team normally does. Plus, I how guess many, you could, but how many clubs even want to do that? Like, you're the exception to the rule with your eighty million dollar payroll. I mean, most teams are not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, how many teams are that. is is Bally's airing this year? I'll just keep keep a close eye on those teams. Um, the, I mean, there's another way you could get creative here too to use Bieber as a means to get out. Stop! Don't yell at me. Let me finish this the sentence. Not saying I'm in favor of this, so just stop. Are you making me play another game where we compare we'll, players to food? We'll, we'll play a game coming up. That, that's not that's not right now. So just don't yell. Let me let me finish the sentence. You could use Shane Bieber as a way to get out from Miles Straw's ah. contract. You gave Straw all that money. You, I I I, I made didn't. your bed, lie in it, or whatever. What's the phrase? Yeah. Why would you lie in the bed after you made it? Um, that that, that kind of goes against conventional wisdom here. Yeah. I think you'd want to go under the covers, not make the bed. Okay, never mind. No, I agree with you. I'm not using Shane Bieber as a way to get out from a contract that shouldn't cripple you. Yeah. The way that we make it seem sometimes. It shouldn't. It really shouldn't. Miles Straw isn't making that much money. The way to do that is the way... It's what they've done with Swisher, Bourne, Josh Bell, where you trade him for an uncomfortable contract that's just shorter in length. I think that's the way to do it. You, you can't hurt your... Again, like, if you package Bieber and Straw, you're saving money. Congratulations to your bank account but you're not making yourself any better yeah you just moved one thing for another in fairness i do feel like we're yelling them for, we're yelling at them about something they they might not even truly be thinking about 
So I'm yelling we at might you, be, not them. We, we, we might be screaming for no reason at all, and they're thinking, "Yeah, duh, you idiots. We're not. We hear all of that. We know that. If only they could sell more. <laughs> if they could sell mugs like us, then they could have <laughs> a huge payroll." Hey, it's almost the first of December, which means we'll be giving away our first mug to a Patreon supporter. How do you become a Patreon supporter, Zach? You subscribe. Patreon.com slash Selby is Godcast. Go join it. Tons of fun. Um, I mean, you can join our Discord if you do that, and then you could see things like this incredible chat GPT review of the Selby is Godcast from our buddy Shoeless Joe Schmo that includes such lines as, if Enlightenment had a soundtrack, it would undoubtedly be the Selby is Godcast, hosted by the enigmatic Selby. Each episode feels like an intimate conversation with a cosmic oracle who effortlessly weaves together humor, wisdom, and a touch of surrealism. That does sound like me. Yeah. <laughs> Selby's soothing voice, that's for sure you. Guides you and of through course, this cosmic tapestry of ideas. <laughs> Beyond the, the Discord, which I love our community there, you get the, we, we do the show every single week. So I know in the off season, people are probably checking their Spotify feeds. They're looking for their rap to see if they're, if the Godcast is their number one podcast. And we did get quite a few people that said, yeah, yeah. Seeing a, quite a, a few that are in like the top 30%, we're in the top 30% of their pod. I don't know. I, I went downtown. Really Freddie Brown had us pretty high on his list. Oh yeah. But you may be looking at that feed in the off season. You may be looking at YouTube, like, and subscribe. It's right down there and thinking, well, there's not that many episodes. We do episodes every single week at Patreon. So that's the, the main selling point. Come join us over there. Come support the show. It helps us bring this entire thing together, the free ones and the paid ones. And we love all of you. We love the community that we have brought together, and, and now it's yours. It's not ours. It is yours. Speaking of yours, not yours, but the Guardians, their coaching staff is finalized. And I don't know. We, we had a conversation about whether or not it was a veteran enough staff over at Patreon. And in reality, looking at it, I feel like they've got some good veteran coaching present of course when you have carl willis and you have sandy alamo on your staff those are two guys that have seen and done a lot in their playing careers and in now in their coaching careers the fact that they've been here before i i like that so vote comes here and he has voices that he can trust i, I need to know more you know, give me an insight into this player well who knows him better than those two two guys and it goes beyond that obviously I like some of the youthfulness they've infused in this staff. And I, I know you said it in the Discord, whether or not we know they're going to be good or bad. Coaches that have been here forever, I don't know if they're good or bad. How do you, how do you rank what they're doing? I, I don't know how much credit to give them. But for a team that I think needed to infuse a little bit more, more than just youth, just new voices, new ideas, sometimes like with, with, with Sarbaugh, he'd been here for so long. Okay, but let's... I like Sarby a lot. Is there benefit from bringing somebody new in here that has seen new parts of other organizations? I think there is benefit there. So I think it's a very interesting staff. I know you've gotten word from from people in other parts of the game that this is a, a very interesting, if not coveted, staff. I, I really like the addition of Correa from what I've read and seen, and there's some, some incredible videos on him on YouTube. Albert Naz, we very briefly got a chance to, to speak there, but we know he has a close relationship with your new manager, Stephen Vogt. And uh, I'll ask you, you remember the, the dynamic between Tito and Brad Mills? They're you know, very different sorts of people, but it worked, right? It's the whole, this person does this thing, this person does the other thing, and then they marry each other. That was Tito and Brad Mills, for sure. They were so very different, but so very, very complimentary of each other. I'm wondering if there's a similar dynamic between Vote and Albernaz here. What do you think? Is that just because Albernaz doesn't have hair and Vote's goofy? <laughs> you can't recreate the odd couple. <laughs> well, in Hollywood now, we're all just about rebooting. So maybe this is just a reboot. Yeah, I, I don't... <laughs> I'm with you. Uh, you know, when I tweeted the full coaching staff, I had so many people reply, 
and say, Valeka's still here? Well, I mean, then this is trash or something. And it's, I, they could have the best offense in the league, the worst offense in the league. How, I have no idea if a hitting coach, what impact to assign them. I, I don't know how you know that. I, 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 you know, how much of it is Valeka thinks everyone should just make a lot of contact and not strike out and not worry about power? Or how much is it, you know, he wishes that he could teach more slugging, but he doesn't have the personnel to do it. I don't know. He has said we need more slugging many times, especially in 2023. So it's just so hard for me to know the exact, like, I can't grade these coaches because I don't know the impact. I mean, I, you can point to guys who had breakout years during otherwise overall bad years, and you can point to guys who didn't take the steps you wanted them to take when it seems like a part of the team did really well. Like, I I don't know. I mean, are we going to crush Carl Willis because J.C. Mejia and Sam Hentges were not good starting pitchers in 2021? Or, like, was the personnel not what it needed to be because they had injuries and didn't have depth? So it's... It's really difficult. All I can say is from talking to other people who have been around them, like Kai Correa and Craig Albernez come very highly advertised. Um, I know there's another team that tried to hire Brad Goldberg like multiple times and he wanted to stay closer to home from Cleveland, went to Ohio state. Um, so I'm sure it's a dream come true for him. So like, I, I don't know. But the way I can tell that it's at least an intriguing staff with some potential is from external sources. And so far, the reviews are good. But again, like we ha- also haven't seen Stephen Vogt be in this position. We haven't seen Albernaz have this much responsibility. We haven't seen this group work together. That's the other thing. Like You need a staff that has cohesion. I think that's what really helped their staff for a lot of the last decade is that they worked together. They knew each other's blind spots. I think that's a big one too. You know, there's going to take some time and there are probably going to be some growing pains just in gelling as a staff. So individually, no idea, just impossible. Like, do we just judge Victor Rodriguez based on how Jose Ramirez hits because he's Jose's number one guy? Like, (laughs) I don't know. Like it's, I have no idea. Um, so it's, it's the toughest thing to do. It's why like I'm, you'll never hear me say fire the hitting coach, fire the pitching coach. Unless like there are like Ty Van Berko was here a very long time. Like I, I certainly was critical of him many times over the years. Um, but it was based on like him saying we didn't, there haven't been adjustments or like just him being there for so long and the offense, um, looking dead in the water for long periods, like that's a little different, but in terms of just like the day to day, it's so much of this gets pinned on a specialized coach because of an overall team statistic where it's more about instruction and like mechanics and mindset. It's, it's just, it's so hard to judge. So People ask, like, is this a good staff? And I'm like, I I have no idea. And I might I not know, know ever. I, I don't even know if good teams have good staffs. They, right. they they might be a good staff because they've got good players on those teams. I, I really don't know. But I'm interested. I think there are a lot of intriguing candidates here and good youth. I love that they went within the organization. They brought up Odor. I, I love that. Uh, you mentioned Goldberg. He's a quick riser. I mean, just a few years ago, I'm... I'm sitting in hosting a, a fill-in show on The Fan. I don't remember who I was hosting with. Might have been Chico. I don't know. Whoever it was. And I, I get informed, hey, we're having a, a guest on today. <laughs> yeah, that was, you You got it. How did you know? We're having a guest on today, a, a guy named Brad Goldberg. That was like four or five years ago. All of a sudden, he's now on the, the Cleveland Major League staff. So very quick riser. You said he's highly coveted apparently at least a little bit and so i'm i'm intrigued to see where this is gonna go i I, I don't know it largely is gonna come down to do you got the players and then once you have good players can you maximize them can you get the most out of them 
We'll see. You, you, you don't have the answer. I don't have the answer, but I like it. I like so far what I'm seeing. Yeah, I, and it's also like just having fresh blood and new perspectives. Like I'm curious. I, I felt like I knew exactly whatever the question I was trying to get answered. Like I knew exactly like, all right, this is, I got to take this to Carl. I got to take this to Sarbi. I got to take this to Valeka. I got to take this to Joe Torres or Brian Sweeney, whoever, right? Now it's like, First of all, they, it seemed, it feels like their staff has doubled in size over the last five years. I mean, there's so many new people. It's like, there's a lot to learn, a lot of perspectives to gain. I mean, Kai Correa is like thought of as a, just a wizard with infield defense. What is it going to be like pairing him with Andres Jimenez? Like, is there more potential for Jimenez to reach? Does this mean that they're going to move him to shortstop and he's going to be the next Ozzie Smith? I mean, well, like what's happening here? Um, so it's just, it's, it's interesting and it, it's, it's kind of, I'm actually kind of excited to just learn about these people and like their philosophies. It's, I mean, you mentioned it during the, the interview process, but the benefits of talking to all these people, right? Like they had Kai Correa in their organization early on, but don't you think that part of the reason they were able to get him is because they also got Albernaz? And like Stephen Vogt has run in some of the same circles as those guys. And like there is a, a, a chain there. And I think you're seeing them sort of reap the benefits just by the wide net that they cast when hiring a new manager. I think even, and this, this is a, a slippery slope. So we're going, we'll unpack this slowly. But I think there's something intriguing and exciting about seeing new players under the watchful eye of different people. Like you were talking about with Andre Semenez, we, we think defensively, this guy, how could he get any better? But there's an element here where you're like, well, damn, I'd like to see him try. Uh, you know, when you bring in, we even talked about this with Valeka. You know, who is he going to get something more out of than you initially thought this guy is not, he's not a part of the team long term. And then by working through him, Maybe he develops into being a building block. Is, is it fair to say Josh Naylor has gone from a guy, eh, he's all right, uh, now he's a, he's a legitimate building block. He's a legitimate part of your franchise. I'm not saying that's entirely v- Vileka, but that's what I'm talking about. Guys that pop in, in different areas. They connect with a different coach. They get a, a different viewpoint on them. Now, the dangerous thing, the slippery slope here, is that if you rely on that too much, if you think, well, we've got the horses here already, and it's just going to take unlocking it. And we don't want to make any big decisions because maybe we're going to miss out on something by sending them away. And, and we, we had all, the, all of the elements to make it work here now because we've got this new coaching staff and we've got new opinions and new ideas. You, you don't want to rely on it entirely. But I do find it intriguing because we're at least going to get one guy, two guys probably, that we're going to completely change the way we think just based on work that a coach does with them and maybe a different philosophy or a di- even just different pregame preparation or how you're having guys stand on the field. If we're talking about defense here with Kai Correa, it's, it's interesting. It's fun. That's, that's where the, the new blood here can maybe serve some positives perhaps. Going into a season, having no idea what the team's identity is going to be, Right. Like I think they were just carrying over 2022 into 2023 because it worked. It didn't work in 2023. And so now you have a new staff to try to figure out how does this team play if it's going to be at its best? What style will work? What positions do we need to put these players in for the, to get the most out of them? We don't know that because, as you said, it's you have different evaluators in place. I like that. I'm not saying it was stale, but it feels like it was a good time to try something new. Yeah, I, I don't think it. one has to mean the other. You, you, you could need a change, but not because the other way was bad. It's just over time, you, you need to freshen things up. Need to rearrange the office office every once in a while just to get the different brain juices flowing. Doesn't mean the old way was bad, but sometimes just a fresh perspective can help. 
and it, it maybe will keep you from making mistakes like signing a free agent. But years later, or months later in some of these cases, turned out to be a big, big mistake. So I'm going to make you play another game. Mm. It's your favorite. Don't even pretend like you didn't like this idea, so we're going to do it. I like games. I don't always like your games. <laughs> Where did this start? What do you have? Well, you wanted to talk about free agent swings and misses. And we teased it last episode on the Patreon show because what a surprise. We fell deep into the abyss of whatever we were talking about and 45 minutes later, we didn't have time to dive headfirst into this topic. So what's changed? So nothing. Yeah, good point. So we have, or I have, <laughs> I have, t I picked 10 free agent flops. I don't know. I might be missing someone. It's a hard thing to go back and make sure you have everybody. So it is certainly possible that some slip through the cracks, but these are the 10 worst or 10 of the worst that I found. And you're going to rank them, I think. But it's, I mean, that's fun. Rankings are fun. Lists, everyone loves a good list. But we could do, anybody can do, you already, I think you put them in an order, right? You already have a top 10. Sort but of. Why just, why just list them when you could pull out a TikTok trend and, and rank them, to with, them without knowing who comes next? So well, the way we're going to play this game, because this list, I don't know where it's going to end up because I don't know who the, I mean, I have an idea of who the 10 may be, but this is your 10. And I'm going to rank them randomly, and i got to guess where they're going to go on the list. And sure, maybe that works early, but what happens when we're only three or f two, three names left on the list? Maybe they don't deserve to go with the only spot I have left. So I don't know. Let's do this. It's a lot of pressure on you. All right. That's the way you like it. Well, so I'm going to start with, so well, let's, let's, let's say this. I think it's important to note the context. What makes a signing so profoundly bad? Because it's not just money. It's what that signing prevented you from doing. How you recovered from that signing. Who that person took playing time from how much time you missed because of injury how were you a contender at the time and this was like a missing piece were you just were you rebuilding and you were at the bottom of the standings so you know it didn't really impact your bottom line one way or the other like there's a lot of play i think and that's why it's on you to try to get this right so let's start Okay. Got my list here. Let's start with Josh Bell. Oh, Josh Bell. Two years, 33 million with the first player option that the Antonetti, Chernoff, maybe even Shapiro regime has ever handed out. trying to remember was there some case where somebody's option turned into a player option i don't know why that's sticking in my brain all right josh bell uh this is it's not one of the worst and it's weird here because if you look at the overall numbers what he ended up at was like the the lower level of what you would have hoped for not not even meet the medium level here but it i think it's within the spectrum of what you would have said Beginning of the year, here's what the numbers are going to look like. Here's what the WRC Plus is going to be. And you'd say, all right, I'll take that. Should they have just I'll kept him? That. Well, are they going to put Khalil Watson into a trade to get Randy a Rosarena? I'm going to say I mean, this they're is... They're paying Gene Segura, I think, 
they owe him eight and a half million this year and two million after that. Yeah. I'm going to put this at number eight. Okay. Not quite at the bottom because what they needed him to be and what he was while he was here didn't align. But this is this is nowhere close to one of the worst. So I'm going to say eight on this list. All right, let's go. Carrie Wood. Whew, I know where I'm sprinting to. Two-year, $20 million deal after the 2008 season. Supposed to be the closer. He had a 480 ERA the first year. Or 480 ERA overall. He was, he was fine the first year. Horrendous the second. So they pawn him off on the Yankees. And he was like unhittable for them in the second half. <laughs> and they haven't really played in reliever free agency much since then. It's like Boone Logan and that's it. Well, I know where I'm going towards the top of this list. It is clearly one of the worst. It's also weird that given where they were at, they gave so much money to a closer when it could have been used elsewhere. So I'm going to say this is the number three, third worst. Okay. Third worst free agent signing. Put it down. Kerry Wood. Michael Bourne. Ooh. Four years, 48 million. He was never the Kenny Lofton-like speed and on-base percentage machine they had hoped for. Just constantly injured. Constantly talking about baseballing the baseball. Good dude. Just didn't work. Trying to quickly pull up his baseball reference page here because I had looked at this the other day. So when we when we lay this out, we we started this back at Patreon because this started with Nick Swisher. Is Nick Swisher on this list? Because I'm reserving the top spot for him. <laughs> okay, yes. that's where this began. That's why it's not a crazy thing. Someone had mentioned that Bourne was there with Swisher, and I I don't agree because Bourne provided more value, way more value. Well, oh. Nick Swisher was like at the end of the day one and a half wins, <laughs> and. Born was in his Cleveland career, he provided 3.7 wins above replacement over a baseball reference. So I don't think that's one of the worst free agent signings of all time. Clearly not one of the best. I'll say it's number six. Number six on this list, Michael Born. Okay. Didn't quite have the uh we said the the expectation and what it had to mean to the team, that weighs into it. Even when they signed him, it was like an added bonus to that offseason. Mm -hmm. Swisher was the guy that was leading the charge on that turnaround. Bourne was like the cherry on top. And so that's what, that also helps separate them, I think. How about David DeLucci? <sighs> All right, here's the argument. Three years, $11.5 Stuck with the team all three years. Was supposed to be the strong side platoon corner outfielder. They've been looking for this guy. I mean, this shows you that they, it's been almost 20 years that they've been looking for like, the solution there. Um, he had a 699 OPS over the three years. And just, he just wasn't good. He did marry Rachel Reynolds from The Price is Right. Um, so, wasn't all bad but just wasn't the answer that they had hoped for. Woof. Negative 0.5 wins above replacement, by the way. Yeah. Tolucci. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm going to put that above Michael Bourne. I think I'm going to go number five, David Delucci. Okay. Number five. David DeLucci and Jason Michaels. That was supposed to be your all-star combination mm -hmm. left fielder. Wayne Garland. <laughs> you 
<laughs> you love it. 10 years, <laughs> 2 million. So if you handed that out now, it might not be that bad. Uh, he stopped pitching after year five. Had an ERA plus of 89. And in those five years, he only threw 613 innings. And I say only because like half of that came in one season. Um, so it was pretty much just a waste. And you think this was in the running for the worst? Ten years. Yeah. What What is signing that contract before the 77 season? What is that worth in today's value? <laughs> Given inflation. What is that? Because I'm, I'm looking at it now and I'm thinking, I, I don't care. <laughs> were, people, were people handing out 10-year deals back then? I don't know. The, the top free agents, remember... Albert Bell signed and he got, what was it, four years? No, five for 50, and he still opted out after two years with Chicago, I think. Yeah, deals were typically, I don't think, to the 10-year level. He did give them 282 innings in his first year. That's incredible with a 414 ERA, so that's not all bad. But that's it. I'm gonna say. Uh, I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say number seven. Okay. Recency bias here is gonna play a factor. I already have an idea. All right. I'm getting nervous because I I've got extremes here, and I'm gonna have to stick somebody near the bottom, and they're probably gonna need to be closer to the top. Brett Myers. Oh God. Seven million dollars. Didn't survive April. <sighs> Just stop right there. Pretty sure Four. everybody hated him. Put him at number four. Once watched him dunk as Drupal Cabrera's kid into a garbage can, I think. <laughs> That's right. I'll never forget one of his, it might have been his first start at Progressive Field, which didn't go well, just like every other appearance for Cleveland, spring training and regular season. The only man who is a pitcher who knows the routine, who I've ever seen upset that reporters were waiting for him at his locker. He had some stern words for members of the, the Indians team at that time. Not teammates, but I'm talking about public relations, people that are working with the communications department. He had some stern words for them, uh, very upset that there was a crowd waiting for him at his locker. Dude, you started the game. <laughs> You're a veteran, and you have been in many different clubhouses. You know how this works. Yeah. Yeah. You just pull a chair up in the middle of the clubhouse and have everyone circle around you. Oh, wait, that was Zach Walters. Brett Myers. God, how do you know? Four starts in, you know, this is over. This is done. And they had signed him. He had been a closer the year before, right? He was a reliever. And then they brought him back to being a starter. Well, and also... that It was the same offseason where they signed... Swisher and Bourne and Tito's first year and everything like, and they were still willing to cut the cord that quickly. Seven million dollars. That I mean, that that's that's an investment. But they knew. Were you putting him fourth? Yeah, he's number four. All right. So you have one, two, nine, and ten available. <laughs> Especially because I already know who I'm putting to if, if if he's on this list, which I have to imagine he is. All right, let's go Nick Swisher. Nick Swisher, he's number one. I mean, this is crazy. Three of the ten were all signed in the same offseason. And that was supposed to be the transformative offseason to usher in the Francona era. Swisher got $56 million over four years. First year wasn't great, but they won. I think they kind of masked it. And then just the production wasn't good there. I think the act retired, September. and that oh, was yeah. that. <laughs> Never forget him hitting the Grand Slam walk-off against the Angels and, hey, guys, I'm back. I'm back. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was the Spider-Man. You don't know what this is, but the Spider-Man, I'm back, I'm back. And then he falls, hits the car on his back, and he's like, my back. That was <laughs> Nick Swisher just totally dreadful number one no doubt about it all right but what about ricky gutierrez wow. three years 11 and a half million 
ahead of the O2 season. This was the master plan. Mark Shapiro takes over for John Hart, trades Robbie Alomar, but oh, no, 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 we're going to thread the needle. We're still going to be a contender because we're going to replace Robbie Alomar with Ricky Gutierrez. And we're also going to benefit from the guys we got in return for Robbie Alomar. So we'll have Gutierrez at second. We'll have Alex Escobar in the outfield. We'll have Jared Riggin in the bullpen. We'll have Matt Lawton in left field. It'll all be great. Everything will work perfectly. Shapiro still, he admits to this day, that approach was a mistake. Ricky Gutierrez, 110 games over two years and 80 OPS plus. The weird part, he was never even an average hitter. Before he came to Cleveland, he was 32 years old when he came to Cleveland. It was odd. And then he needed a neck vertebrae fusion. So like it's, it was a train wreck. And I mean, I, I don't want to give away like what I have on this list, but to me, the, I think this, the timing plays into this, right? Like that's, that was an important moment in the franchise you're going from the glory days to whatever's next and i think his contract and how that went paved the way for the whatever next to be a little rough so they sign him him entering the age 32 season he had had back-to-back seasons with the cubs which were decent 99 ops plus 97 ops plus the two years prior but weren't those his best years too yes so here's, that's kind of what I'm getting to. That happened, sir, his age 30 and 31 season. He is much better than pretty much every other year of his career. What leads you to believe that that, that's what's worth betting on, not the guy he had been every year up to that point? And oh yeah, middle infielder, I know he starts at shortstop, so he's moving further down the defensive spectrum by moving to second base. But middle infielder, now entering age 32 season? And you're, you're hoping, beyond hope, that he's reaching his ceiling, which is league average bat. Mm-hmm. But I know, he hit 290. He hit 290 before they signed him. So, league average, 290. Come on. Much better than league average. Yeah, I'm going to say, well, I mean, I don't have much choice. It's either 2, 9, or 10. <laughs> I don't know what's 10. So, I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to say Gutierrez 10. So, I don't want to look... S- I don't want to look silly. This well, is I already do. Fascinating. All right. Jack McDowell. Two years, $10 million. He was supposed to be the starting pitcher who put them over the top. What was the one thing they were missing in the 90s? It was that ace. That guy you want to get. You're excited to Smaller give him the ball. Smaller strike zone. In that decisive playoff game. But... In 96, he was slightly below average, and in 97, he pitched 40 innings. It was a bust. I do remember him catching a line drive back to him with his bare hand. That was cool. Was that worth $10 million? Uh, Yeah, I think so. Mm, yeah, okay, sure. Two or nine. 13 games. He won 13 games in 1996. Zach, what else do you want from the guy? Wow. 13 games. To go along with that 5'11 ERA. <laughs> Dude, you, at the age of 13, could have won 13 games for the 96 Cleveland Indians with the offense that they had. Uh, So that, yeah, I was reserving the number two spot for Jack McDowell. There was the one guy that I thought could challenge Swisher, and at the end, I still don't believe he quite got there. But the, the biggest thing that does launch him up is, I don't... Looking at his numbers previously, he wasn't really an ace. He was like an... Ace light. It was a guy that would anchor a rotation because maybe you didn't have anybody better. But he just, you just thought he was going to give you 200 innings and he was just going to be really solid. And for this team, that's all they needed. Innings of solid pitching. And God, he was terrible. And this team needed it. And they were playing catch up with that rotation and the bullpen for years and years. Part of it is because Jack McTell never gave them what they were coveting to be their, their number two. So I, I think in this case, he was the number two worst signing, worst free agent signing. So that leaves number nine for you, and you're saying that's Keith Hernandez. 
star of Seinfeld. Okay. okay. Who they plucked Th- out of Hollywood to play first base, but he didn't really play much. Is is that is he on this list because he was actually one of the worst, or is it meme territory now? He signed a two-year, three and a half million dollar deal at the very end of his career, had a 521 OPS, and then just didn't play the next year. And I have heard stories about him reading Gettysburg books in the hot tub after games. That's the extent of my knowledge well, of his tenure in there. Cleveland. But I mean, it was it was a waste. He was horrendous, and he was also yeah. he was just he was done. That's that's the main thing. Yeah, it was the Mike Holmgren. <laughs> yeah. Just show up, cash your check, head home. Doesn't matter if it's two in the afternoon. No, I'm I'm out of here. But I actually. I think nine's a good place for him mm. on this list. Yeah, I think that's right. I don't feel too bad about this list, to be honest. No, you should. Um, so here's... Do you want to read through what you <laughs> have? the worst. Yes. And then I'll give you what I have. All right. Uh, worst, without knowing who was coming next, there was Swisher 1, McDowell 2, Wood 3, Myers 4, DeLucci 5, Bourne 6, Garland 7, Bell 8, Hernandez 9, Gutierrez number 10. Give me your list that actually involved homework. I had Gutierrez first. Say what? The reason being this, and it's not all his fault, but if you look at just the moment in time, he tricked them into thinking that they were still good. They had a barren farm system. I mean, Robbie Alomar's career fell off a crater after that, so I think they were right in trading him. As Shapiro would tell you now, they just didn't target the right pieces in trading him. Um, they needed to replenish their farm system and signing Gutierrez tricked them into thinking they were still good. And I think that set them back. And he was, I mean, he was, it was bad. And that was a lot of money back then. Three years, 11 and a half million. It's a decent chunk of change. Um, I had Wayne Garland second. It, 1977. Why are you signing anyone to a 10 year deal? That'd be like giving like, look, Wayne Garland is not like, Shohei Otani, but that would if you're going to give Wayne Garland a 10 year deal in 1977, then you should give Shohei Otani a 75 year deal right now. Whoever wants to sign him, I, I why are you handing anybody a 10 year deal? Especially you, you hear that, San Francisco, 75 years that's the number to beat right now. Pitchers don't get 10 year deals now, <laughs> like nine is the max. That's Garrett Cole, yeah, but it is. Late seventies guys are still throwing like mid seventies, and you're thinking, "Yeah, I can throw three hundred innings every single year. Who cares?" Till his arm falls off. Um, I I going Jack McDowell third. I just think they kept. It's like like I had to learn, um, with headphones. Just get freaking AirPods. Stop buying, like, stop trying to to save a few bucks because, oh, well, I can get these wireless earbuds and, like, they work almost as well. And, like, then they malfunction. I'm like, oh, let me try another one. Or, like, when I was a kid and I got, like, every MP3 player under the sun, just get a freaking iPod, man. Stop Jack McDowell. Oh, let's get Jeff Juden in here or John Smiley. Just freaking trade for Pedro, okay? Or Randy Johnson. Just do it. Same thing with McDowell. What do you, what do you, just go get the guy. All right. Don't hope that this guy becomes the guy because he's not going to be. And that, that, that killed him. Nick Swisher four. Remember the unfinished business t shirts before the 2014 in, in spring training? Was that business finished or no? Did he term it finished? No, he was out of here before. The business he, was finished. He was finished. Yeah. Isn't it? I yeah. guess the business still isn't finished. No, still very much unfinished. Carrie Wood five. The, I would have had that higher, but like they traded CC in two thousand eight. Did you think same thing? Like, did you think you were going to be good in two thousand nine? Like that, I'm fine. Go like if you have money to spend, spend it. But you weren't a Carrie Wood away from being a legitimate contender. Going into 2009. Um, Brett Myers, sixth. I, what else can we say about him? That was literally just, they could have lit 
seven million dollars on fire. Same thing. But oh, that would have been more fun. But also, they proved that they didn't need him, so it wasn't like super detrimental. <laughs> the Scott Casimir became what they needed from Correct. Brett Myers. Michael Bourne, seventh. He probably should be close to Swisher in these rankings, but I guess because Swisher signed first and was like the marquee guy and the big team leader and everything, it feels like he was a bigger failure. Also, Michael Bourne never yelled at me. <laughs> Same. Swisher yelled at you too? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, he did. For asking a positive question. How dare you? I yelled at whatever. What a jerk. Uh, Keith Hernandez, eight, David DeLucci, nine, and Josh Bell, 10. Wow. That's, that's quite a different list. Whatever. I can't wait for the next top 10 where you're going to, we're going to flip the script here and you're going to do something else. Should Mike Zanino have been on there or anyone we're missing that comes to mind? You know, what would be a good idea? Let us know down there in the comments. That's where it's calling your name or on Spotify or wherever else in the discord, perhaps. How do you do that? Patreon. Good place to start. Speaking of starting in a few days, those winter meetings will be started up. Do you think we'll see anything like this? A three team deal between the Cubs, Guardians and Rays that features Shane Bieber and Will Brennan going to the Cubs. The Rays getting Rokio and a couple of prospects back from the Cubs. And the Guardians getting Randy Arosa Arena. Bieber, Brennan, Rokio for Arosa Arena. You in on that? Yes. Yeah, everybody in this says yes, except for Rays fans. They are giving it thumbs down. Okay, here's another one for you. You might have to think harder about this one. Guardians get Randy Arosa Arena. Reds get Shane Bieber. Rays get a couple of prospects coming over from the Reds and one Logan T. Allen. Would you trade Logan Allen and Shane Bieber out of this rotation? <laughs> How does that work for Randy or Rosarena? You'd have to flip prospects for a starting pitcher or two and sign somebody. If I had, if I knew the contingencies to fill out my rotation, yeah, I would. I would consider that strongly. Arias Bieber Stefan for a Rosarena. Yeah, these are all baseball trade values. I'm just going through the list of fan submitted ones. <laughs> I mean, this is why they say the Selby is Godcast is more than a podcast. It's a portal to a higher plane of audio enlightenment. Praise be to Selby. It says. <laughs> Ah, we'll see you at Patreon, where Zach will be at the winter meetings, and we'll be doing shows from the winter meetings. You need to be here while eating Hattie B's. <laughs>